I put my running shoes on this morning. Nikes. I've always loved Nikes. When I was 10, I remember being in a shoe shop trying on a pair. I really wanted them, but they were too small. So I curled up my toes at the end, and I pretended they were a perfect fit. My parents bought them for me. Brilliant. Two weeks later, though, of course, my feet were covered in blisters, and I had to admit, they were unwearable. But the weird thing was, I didn't chuck them out. I still loved my Nikes. I loved how they smelled, how they looked, and I put them on a shelf in my bedroom. Very odd behavior. Fast forward 35 years, I'm still in my Nikes. Today, I work for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. We're a collaborative network of reporters around the world, and we try and find clever ways of working together to tell global stories that we can't really tell so well on our own. You may have heard of the Panama Papers. We brought together more than 90 media organizations from around the world to study what was the biggest leak in the history of journalism. Our reporting ended up shining a light into some of the darkest corners of the offshore world. Tax avoidance, evasion, money laundering, corruption, fraud, it was a huge story. And we were very proud to win a Pulitzer Prize for that work. Then just as we were breathing out, boom, another massive leak lands. 1.4 terabytes of documents. That's more than enough to fill a university library uh, probably many times over. Again, it's about offshore. Again, it's about secrecy and tax. And this was a project that would become known as the Paradise Papers. Now, I want to tell you one story today from the Paradise Papers and about how we chased it down. So let's start. We've got 1.4 terabytes of data. Where do you begin? You start by looking for patterns. What links? Uber, Botox, and Nike. One of the patterns we found. And the answer is they all have subsidiaries in an office block in Hamilton, Bermuda. Middle of the North Atlantic Ocean, thousands of miles off the coast of South Carolina, population less than 70,000 people. What are these companies doing, and what are they doing in Bermuda? We scoured the public record around the world, and we could find almost nothing about these companies. And very quickly, it looked like this was going to be one of the many dead ends from our leaked data. But before we threw in the towel, it occurred to me we should go back to the first rule of journalism, follow the money. Where does the money trail start in a company like Nike? It starts when you go into a store and you buy some shoes and you hand over your money, where does that money go? So that's what I did. I bought the shoes I'm wearing today. That's the receipt I was given. And you can see, I paid 49 pounds. I bought some socks too, total bill 56. It's an ordinary receipt. On the back, there's a clue as to where the money went. Nike Retail UK, and there's an address in Sunderland in the north of England. And I checked it out, and sure enough, there is a Nike subsidiary company at that Sunderland address, but it's not called Nike Retail UK. It employs about 250 people. It's called something else. So what's Nike Retail UK? It's not a company at all, it turns out. That's the name that a Nike company in the Netherlands uses when it trades in the UK. So when I went into the store in London and I bought my shoes, I handed over my cash, I handed it over, to a Dutch company. This is the start of the money trail. Now you remember I said I'm part of this international ICIJ, international collaboration, so I went away and I shared these findings with my colleagues. And one by one, all over Europe, these reporters, they went out very excited, and they too bought running shoes. And they came back and they studied their receipts, and they found that they would bought their shoes from a Dutch company. So this is interesting. Now the pictures really, if it's a jigsaw, we're in, we've sort of got a corner here that's Europe, and the pieces are coming together nicely. But they're not connected with Bermuda and our leaked data. 
I just want to pause. We're going to set the unfinished jigsaw to one side for a second. We'll come back to Nike. And I just want to think very, very basically about how tax works. We're going to try an exercise. I want everyone in the room to pretend, imagine you are a small company. So, well, and we're going to split people up. So in the stalls to my left, I'd like the people here to be the small companies of the United States. And stores on my right, I'd ask you to be the small companies of Europe. And then we're going to have Asia, South America, Australasia, and Africa. All the small companies of the world in the room. We work, we work really hard, and we make a profit. And at the end of the year, we get a tax bill. The rate of tax that you pay on your profits, of course, depends on where you're sat. You don't have a choice, that's how it is. That's how tax works. It's insultingly obvious, and I apologize. But I want to develop things a little now with another scenario. So start again. This time, I want everyone in the room to imagine they're a subsidiary company within the Nike group. We're going to keep the same geographies. So we've got the US here, we've got Europe here, and then we've got the rest of the world. Apologies, this story doesn't focus on you so much. We'll be focusing down here. And back to Europe, the, the front row, I'm going to ask you to be the Netherlands for us. And on the US side, Madam, you in the aisle seat, you're going to be Bermuda. Look around. Everyone else in the house is sat in a seat where they pay tax. There is no tax in Bermuda, so you're very lucky. That is our setup. So let's now look at how the money flows. If you remember, we have customers all over Europe, some of them journalists, are buying their running shoes. And the money is cascading down to the front row here, the Netherlands. It's a wash with money. If the story were to stop there, it would be a disaster for Nike. The tax rate in the Netherlands is really quite high. So Nike needs to shift this money onwards. It needs to ship it out of the Netherlands. And some of you will already be anticipating where that money might be going. But it's not straightforward. You can't just rip your income out of one country because you don't like the tax rate and plonk it in Bermuda it's, it, 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 just because you want to. When you transfer money from one subsidiary to another, it has to be a payment for something. And if you're, you transfer a lot of money, it has to be a payment for something very valuable. So what's the most valuable thing in the whole of the Nike empire? Put it another way, what makes a 10-year-old boy lie about some shoes that don't fit? The answer is, the brand, the swoosh down the side of every shoe that they sell. These are trademarks. And these are Nike's most valuable assets. And Nike has very carefully packaged up the trademarks for Europe and put them into just one subsidiary here in the room. Bermuda. That's the key. That's what allows huge amounts of trademark royalty fees to be paid from the Netherlands to Bermuda every year. It's about a billion dollars. It's not small change. And to be clear, in Bermuda, there are no Nike employees. That's just the place where the profits get, get reported. So we take a step back now. We admire our detective work. This is amazing. We found the money trail. But does it matter? This is all Nike money. It's not new money. It's Nike money churning around inside Nike. Who cares when Nike reports its profits? Certainly, Nike doesn't talk about it. I went back through 15 years of stock market updates, and I found only one remark that re appeared to relate to our money trail. Five days before Christmas, 2006, the chief executive is on the phone to Wall Street analysts on the East Coast. It's a routine, regular call, and he's giving them an update of performance. And he just mentions in passing, oh, we've secured a favorable long-term tax deal in Europe. He mentions the Netherlands, but then he quickly moves on. And the analysts, they don't ask any questions. Perhaps it doesn't matter. 
Let's take a look. I'm going to show you now a chart that shows what's happened to Nike's uh, global tax rate, worldwide tax rate, going way back to 2000. Before I do that, this obviously there's no such thing as a worldwide tax. This is the weighted average of all the rates of all you subsidiaries here in the room. So there's the chart. You can see that for many years, Nike's paying 35%, about 35% of its worldwide profits in taxation. And then there's a cliff edge, and it drops. That's the moment when Nike tells the analyst, we've secured a deal in the Netherlands. It's, it's the deal that allows the profits to get shifted to Bermuda. You see this another small dip a bit further on. That's Nike changing its tax, uh, tax haven again. It, it, it's not an important change. We're not going to deal with that today. The big picture is that Nike is making billions of dollars of profits every year. And when the, there's a step change down, more than 10%, 35 to below 25%, and it never recovers, that step change has consequences. It means bigger returns for shareholders. It means bigger bonuses for the bosses. But it means lower tax receipts for governments, less money to spend on schools, hospitals, roads, police, all the public services you care about. Now, if any of that's shocking to you, the incredible thing is Nike is not at all alone. You remember I mentioned Uber and Botox earlier. We found similar behaviors there. In fact, all global corporations are constantly on the hunt for these kinds of arrangements. If you're big enough, this is the game you can play. Remember, we were, we were all small companies earlier, and you just you pay the tax where you're sat. You can't play the game. So what's, what's being done about this? Actually, we're at a moment of unprecedented change in the world of international taxation. There's a lot going on, but it's confusing. Some countries are actually opening up their rules. They're inviting more profit shifting and tax avoidance. Other countries are clamping down on this kind of behavior. And then there's sort of a large group in the middle who are very confused and seem to be doing a lot of both of these things at the same time. But I want to finish by telling you what the Netherlands are doing. The good news is the Dutch have promised, they promised that they're going to uh, scrap their tax rules that have allowed the shipment out to Bermuda. Those rules are going. That's the good news. However, they are deep in discussion. It's not going to happen until 2020, and they're deep in discussion about how the replacement rules are going to look. And they're in discussion, amongst others, with a group called AMCHAM, the American Chambers of Commerce. And who sits on the tax committee of AmCham? Uber and Nike. Ah. So we can, we can hope that the Dutch tax reforms are going to make the world a fairer place and, and fingers crossed and everything. But there is a chance, I've got to warn you, that I'll be back in a couple of years' time with a tale to tell about what the Netherlands and Nike did next. Thank you.